Hi, this is Ushio, and welcome back to Echo. It is Sunday. On Jenna's route, we're nearing the end of her journey and her story. And it's been pretty traumatic. The last episode was pretty horrific. There were some nasty torture sequences that happened, and I didn't like that. So we just escaped from that situation, and we are out of here. I could still feel the stitches in my leg, even though I pulled out the little bits of the line a half hour ago. Despite living here a vast majority of my life, even I had trouble figuring out where the hell we were. As I walk and the stinging throbs with every step, I close my eyes and realise how exhausted I really am. Running off extreme adrenaline for a day will take the wind out of you. So will multiple blows to the head, and torture, apparently. I keep imagining that when I open my eyes, I'll be back in my dorm. I'll sit up from my bed, and Vincent will be tapping away at his laptop on the other side of the room. I tell him that I had a fucked up dream, and he'd tell me in that too cool for school tone to blog about it. The rhythmic tapping was at first really annoying, but now it's kinda like a white noise machine. It helps me sleep for some weird reason. Maybe because it makes me feel like I'm not so alone. Chase. I inhale sharply, nearly tripping over a clump of weeds. Jenna places a precautionary arm out in front of me before easing back when she sees I've got my balance again. You still with us? She looks me up and down, as if looking for signs that I'm turning into another Leo situation. Yeah, Leo's really spaced out. Almost possessed, perhaps? Said Wolf is still with us, ambling along like he can't even feel that half his leg was stitched to mine less than an hour ago. I look back to her, nodding. Yeah. Exhausted, but that's to be expected, I guess. Hmm. Ordinarily, I'd love a quiet walk with you at night, though considering the circumstances... She pauses, looking over her shoulder. Well, it could be worse. You had a guardian angel. She noticeably stiffens as I bring up the topic of what just happened. I'm trying not to think about it. Yeah, the creepy spooky dude came out of the wardrobe and rushed Brian through the window. It, it was a violent scene, and it was over very quickly. None of us had gone around to check out where Brian was dragged. In fact, we made a beeline in the opposite direction. Ordinarily, the lights of the town would guide us where to go, but everything's dark, the moon our only real source of light, and even that is partially obscured. The productive thing to do is just think ahead right now. We will come into town along the back roads, get to the motel and take your car. I give her an affirmative thumbs up. Micah, meanwhile, is clutching his knife tight. It reminds me of how he was with the wrench earlier, when he was worried about Leo attacking him. Now the two walk nearly side by side. Everyone but Leo's rattled, that's for sure. I can't tell if it's a supposed hysteria's fault, or just a completely rational reaction to all the shit that's happened today. Micah's usually arrogant and gruff demeanor is replaced by a more timid posture, the back rubbing his neck like he can't believe he's alive. I try to think of something to say as he turns his face to me. Micah... I'm sorry about Keith. Yeah. He responds simply, sucking in his lower lip for a moment between one of his fangs before speaking again. Still not sure exactly what happened, but now I have a more definitive idea. He looks ahead again, shifting the topic. I had a dream about you, you know. Oh? After we spoke, I only got a little bit of sleep, but um, what I did dream stuck out to me. You were holding me underwater, drowning me. A cold chill creeps along my spine. Jenna looks over, raising her brow curiously at the bat. Leo stares straight ahead, unfazed. That's... weird. Why are you telling me this? Micah waves his hand, dismissing my question as he continues. You were holding me underwater, and it was fucking terrifying because I couldn't breathe? Your hands around my throat felt exactly like that noose did, the way they bristled and cut into my neck. He points to matted fur around his throat, the pinkish raw rubbed flesh visible even in the dark. But, talking emotionally and shit, I started feeling thankful. Thankful that I was kidding you. That's rather macabre. The bat nods, seemingly well aware of how strange it sounds. Yet he doesn't relent, noting how exceptionally strange everything else has been lately. I'd be willing to take anything at face value at this point. Mm-hmm. Like you were freeing me. Real fucked up suicidal shit. When I was up in that news, though, I didn't want to die, so that part didn't translate. Honestly surprised I didn't piss and shit myself. Did you guys? Jenna stares blankly at him. No. I did not. 
No. Leo, of course, is silent. To think I almost left town a couple of days ago would have never gotten caught up in this mess. Well, why did you really disappear the first time, back in 2008? Micah fiddles with something in his pocket, taking it out and peering it over. I can't quite make out what it is. Something plastic and thick. A lot of reasons. My folks turned on me after finding out about some shit one night. Came home to find my room all torn up, all my belongings outside. My mum wouldn't stop fucking boarding, screeching like a dying chicken at me. My dad, meanwhile, had his old police baton, kept coming at me with it whenever I tried to come inside. Kept screaming to let me in and apologising for every little screw up that I could think of. None of it worked. I tried to sleep on the porch, but dad came out and started kicking me in the back till I left. Jenna grimaces. That's awful. Leo looks back over his shoulder, slowing his pace, some to match ours. I can tell he's at least half listening now, no longer as spaced out. Keith was gone, and, uh, didn't really have anywhere else to go. Wasn't too popular as I recall, even with Heather, Clint and Jeremy, they had their own problems. Should have told me. The words catch Micah by surprise, the wolf staring at him from across the shrubbery. Hey, I know we just survived a near-death experience together, but no need to be getting all retroactively sappy. We turn a small bend around the sandy embankment, some old car parts scattered in the underbrush. The moon's finally visible from behind Echo Canyon, and I can make out what Micah's carrying. It's Brian's cell phone. I guess he's going to try and take that in as evidence. As he moves to push it back into his pocket, it slips and clatters against a rock beneath him. Ah, fuck. I'll get it. Leo bends down, taking hold of the phone. The screen shattered, and a few silvers of glass fall to the ground. Damn it. The bat extends out his hand. Thanks. Leo doesn't budge, still staring at the shattered device. Then from beyond the desert scrub and scattered car parts, a mechanical roar. Lights flashes before us, and Leo holds up his paw to shield himself from the light. It takes me just a moment to realise their headlights, and the roar is the start of an old engine. It's a van, sitting right in front of us, and it's all too familiar. This is bad. Oh no. What? Jenna reels back, eyes wired. That wasn't there a moment ago. She mutters, craning her neck some to peer through the red-tinted window to see who's behind the wheel. After a moment of inspection, it's clear that there's no one inside. Jenna. What? Jenna, this is the dream from the van? The one I told you about? Oh, come on. Jenna doesn't sound incredulous to my claim, just exhausted. She crosses her arms tightly over her chest, not letting her eyes leave the sight of the idling vehicle. Okay then, what's it doing here? I don't have an answer for her, and therefore remain silent, stepping away from the front of the vehicle in case it somehow takes off. Micah, meanwhile, looks confused. He peers around, his yellow eyes bright and shimmering in the focus of the headlights. What the fuck? I know where we are. But we were headed into town toward the motel. How the fuck are we here? We didn't cross the highway, did we? I look to our east, and sure enough, there it is. The weathered asphalt of Route 65. I would have noticed if we crossed the pavement. Someone would have. It's the complete opposite direction that we should be heading. Jedda gasps, seemingly realising this a little after the rest of us. We've been here before. Leo speaks up, clutching the side of his head with the winds. You recognise it too, right? Leo still sounds half asleep, turning to face us. Though it appears he's only speaking to Micah and I. The bat blinks. Oh, fuck. Um, you dreamed about this too, Chase. I swallow and nod, clutching my clammy paws against my shirt. I think so. The dream from earlier had already begun to fade from my memory, as most dreams do, but the way I felt watching it is still very clear, and this whole scene is starting to give me some serious deja vu or something like it. There was an albino guy? He had bright red eyes and got ran over. The van's motor continues to idle, humming as it waits. Oh, mine was a little different. Micah doesn't elaborate. No, we've been here before in real life. Implying that this is not real life. Micah glances over at the wolf, and the two exchange a look for a moment. Jenna steps forward and tucks at the driver's side door. It opens with a quiet creak, some errant cobwebs fraying apart as the door is pulled fully open. She squints at something by the wheel, 
and then reaches in and taps it. Keys are in the ignition, and there's this big red glare on the dash. Maybe a check engine light? She frowns to herself. It looks like this thing hasn't been used in a while. Sans whoever's turned it on, but I'm no mechanic. If only there were one among us now. Leo. She pokes her head out, raising an inquisitive brow at the wolf. You're welcome to take a look, if you're feeling up to it. She eyes Leo up, examining his physical condition. Her expression is a mixture of scepticism and concern. Leo begins to limp toward the van, and Micah quickly steps up beside him to keep him from tipping over. He grunts appreciatively in response, speaking up. It's probably not a check engine light. What makes you say that? Those didn't really exist back when it was made, before the mid-90s. Are you guys thinking we can drive this out of Echo? I'm a little more concerned with wondering who turned this on in the first place, and how we even got here, but that's an optimistic thought, Chase. So, maybe this is a gift horse that we're looking squarely in the mouth right now? Doubt it. Micah rasps, helping Leo prop himself against the driver's side door as Jenna steps aside. The light looks like it isn't coming from the dash. Leo clumsily grasps the steering wheel, peering closer. It's like it's being reflected off the odor meter, but I don't see a direct source. How Leo can see clearly at all after repeated blows to the head may be the real question here. That's fucking weird. A shuffling noise comes from the back of the van, and everyone freezes. There's a raggedy fabric partition hiding everything past the front seats from view. Gingerly, Leo pulls it aside and squints into a red light illuminating his face. Anyone back there? Leo doesn't immediately respond, and I can't see him well enough where I'm standing. I limp my way up beside Jenna. Leo? She inquires again, more urgent. No, not right now. There is something back there, though. Well, that's obvious enough. I'm too big to squeeze between the seats. I'm gonna go around. Everyone takes a step back out of the now seemingly coherent wolf's way as he exits the van. Fucking deja vu, something fierce right now. You too. Jenna gives us both a quizzical look as Leo braces the handle of the rusted van door and gives it a yank. At first it doesn't budge, but after another hard tug, the door flies open, one door partially unhinged as it dangles to one side. There's something standing in the middle of the van on three spindly legs. The red light projects from something on the top, and it begins to flash on and off. A camera on the tripod. At first I think it's mine, but upon closer inspection, it looks like an older model. No fucking way. Micah quickly backs away, nearly tripping over a prickly pear cactus in his haste. Uh-uh. Nope, this isn't real. Everyone pack it up. We're being filmed? What is this? Some elaborate prank show. This is 100% not funny. Leo says nothing, climbing up into the back of the van and turning the display monitor on the camera around. On this, a little red dot in the corner flashes on and off, in time with illumination of the rest of the cab. The display screen itself shows the standing there at the back of the van, though the image is fuzzy and distorted. I wonder how long this has been here. That's my camera. Micah shouts in surprise, looking briefly to the rest of us before lowering his voice some. Or, well, the high school's camera, but they were shit at keeping inventory. I ditched it after my folks kicked me out. Okay, but what's it doing here? Why is it recording? Judging by the looks on everyone's faces, I don't think anyone has an answer to that. Leo brings a heavy paw up to his eyes, rubbing them some before peering at Micah and then the screen and back again. Micah cants his head some at the wolf, letting out a slow exhale. Either this is one fucked up joke wolf by or I'm beginning to think that this is the hum's doing. The hum? He mentioned that before, by the motel. Wow, haven't heard that word in a while. What's the hum? It's uh, hard to describe. Bad dreams, like we talked about before. Feels kind of like Vision Quest shit, real spiritual stuff that Keith talked about a lot. Wasn't good vibes though, bad energy only. The thing is, it only really happens when you're sleeping, and I'm wide ass awake. He extends his arms out to his side for a moment before gripping the van's door, thumbing up the chipped paint. I haven't thought about that in a while. Jeremy and Adam talked about it when I was younger, after I mentioned seeing... The thing we just saw half an hour ago, she wants to say, but she still visibly can't quite accept that. Not yet. You know what? I don't, but as I was saying, you can kind of tell when it's happening, because it's more than just a nightmare. Your ears start buzzing. Like, uh, 
One of them orchestra bands tuning up. Violins in your skull, you know. A creeping sensation that I know exactly what he's talking about builds in my gut. You hear it too? What, like, right now? Leo stares for a moment before nodding. One of the bat's large ears flicks, then he turns his head from side to side. I don't think so. He pauses. Maybe. Might be the engine. He shifts attention back to the vehicle, yanking on the van's door thumb. The spooky ass ghost van engine. The metal frame of the van seems to rattle in response, though that might just be my imagination. Sometimes I'd go out into the hills and just camp out away from home, because the hum wasn't as bad there. Heather did it a bunch with me too, though uh, she had her other reasons. Jenna nods, exhaling slowly before crossing her arms over her chest. So, I suppose then you have a theory about all this? One based in, what, Masata spiritualism? Honestly, I thought it was like radon poisoning or something. But you get the hum in a few other places around town too, I've slept all over. The rail yard, the lake, this van, they're all real hummy places. You've slept in this van before? Despite everything that's happened, the idea that anybody would want to take a nap in this creepy thing is dubious at best for Jenna. Well, Micah trails off. For what usually so coarse and brazen, his seeming awkwardness right now feels out of place for him. We both have. Briefly. Leo places the flat of his palm on the bed of the cab. Flattened cardboard boxes and ratty bits of fabric that must once have been blankets or towels cover the surface. The large canine's brow furrows some, and finally he looks back up at all of us. It may just be me, but he doesn't seem as sluggish anymore. Jenna lets out an exhausted amused noise, letting her arms flop down to her sides. Truly, I'm not sure I see the appeal. Leo and Micah look at each other. There's a silence. Wait, hold on. You're not saying... I was so stupid. We were both stupid. Micah squeezes the bridge of his nose, closing his eyes as if cringing at himself. I was such a skeevy little bitch back then, I don't know why I pushed. No, I didn't mean it like that, Micah. I meant for what happened after. You had it rough, and I didn't care. Or if I did, I didn't wanna, because of what happened at the party. I feel like an outsider looking in at some intimate conversation that I don't understand. Which is a feeling I can't say I felt when I'm around Leo. He'd always go out of his way to include me in everything. What party? What are you guys talking about? Chase, the... 2008, that Dia de los Muertos party at the Parsons warehouse. The one where you told me you were gay, the night we got together. I blink. My parents had caught me watching gay porn that morning on the computer, and I was afraid to come home to them, so I went to some party at Parsons. The night itself is kind of a blur. I remember getting in a very brief fight with a guy who dumped beer on TJ, and then waking up with Leo over me, eyes full of concern. Somehow, I ended up confiding everything to him, about me being into guys. He apparently had a hunch about it, and next thing I knew, he was ushering me out of the old warehouse to walk home with him. We kissed by the rail yard by his house, and that was about the start of our relationship proper. Still, something always seemed a bit off about that party, and the way Leo was acting. I think I remember some dude trying to come up to talk to him, and Leo telling him off before insisting that I not ask about it. He seemed really serious at the time. Didn't want to ruin a good thing, or something like that. I didn't get a good look at the guy he talked to, but was he carrying a camera? The wolf taps the side of the tripod with his fingertips. Leo, you're reprehensible. Jenna's voice is cold and curt. Jenna? What? Shut up. Jenna looks taken aback, but only for a split second before shaking her head in disbelief. Leo winces, clutching his wounded head, his reddish eyes flick up to meet mine. I shouldn't have agreed to it. I was just... Jenna quickly interjects, stepping in front of me. No, Leo, this whole week has just proven to me time and time again that you're just... She stares, letting out a hot puff of air between her lips before spreading her arms wired. Just perfect for Echo. You truly, truly belong here. You know that? God, how old were you then? How old was Micah? Did you even care? Fucking hell, are you about done? The bat pivots on his heel away from the van to face Jenna, his eyebrows narrowed beneath his bangs. Look, you don't know me. I ain't some fucking victim. Shit was my choice. What? What was your choice? Chase, you're an absolute idiot sometimes. Jenna sounds very disgusted. I frown at her, wondering what the fuck I did wrong. And I abandoned you. 
Jenna visibly seethes. None of this, she points to the rusty van, that same red light flashing on and off, makes any sense. But all your actions completely do. You're all just so perfect for this town, thinking any of that was okay. She throws up her hands, legs shaking with frustration. Is she including me in this? It isn't. I'm gone. Done. Jenna. She turns to leave, though a crackling in the front of the van brings her to a halt. Hey. From the console, the distorted voice I've become all too familiar with rings forth again. It's coming from the old radio, the audio crackling through dusty speakers. Jenna recognises it instantly and begins stepping back away from the van again. We should go. Now. Her voice is shaky. The air itself seems fuzzy, electric, like I'm breathing in hundreds of tiny strands of vibrating twine. That sounds like Chase. Hi. Leo is the only one to outright respond back and Micah looks at him with a bewildered expression. Don't talk to the hum. It's Chase. Chase is right there, dipshit. He gestures to me, still standing gobstopped at the back of the van. Leo slowly looks back at me, squinting at my chin, then my eyes. It's me. Let's go home. He sees there isn't my mouth moving, and his eyes widen a little more. A small line of blood runs down from a spot just behind his ear down to his jaw. I promise I won't bring it up again. Let's go home. Who gives a fuck what the others say? You know I'm right. I remember saying those exact words after Flynn blasted us for skipping Jenna's birthday party in 10th grade. I'd convinced Leo to hang out with me instead. I was addicted to private time with him. I promise I won't bring it up again. We're all silent, staying at the dark cab where the noise is coming from. Except for Leo. He's looking directly at me. Leave. Why? He asks me. I... I'm not sure what to say. It's not me speaking, but those are my words. Everything feels hazy. Hazy and wet. Micah leans his head into the van, trying to get the wolf's attention. Leo, Keith always said not to talk to the hum. That's what this shit is, no doubt. The hysteria? It has a voice? Apparently, it's your fucking voice, Chase. No wonder everyone's so damn rolled up about you coming back. But why me? Do I look like some kind of Meseta wise man? Micah grunts, fidgeting from foot to foot. Despite his demeanour, he's definitely visibly unnerved by all of this. I'm parroting shit I heard from a guy who's probably dead. For a while, when I was younger, I thought I heard Keith's voice too, telling me the shit I wanted to hear, but that shit wasn't good for me. So, I got the fuck out of town. Jenna throws her hands up, squeezing the pendant on her necklace. I can't handle this. I'm gonna do what the spooky van wants and leave. It's not the van. The voice in my head speaks, softly, like a whisper from right behind my ear. It's a masculine voice, but not my own. An older man, with kind of an old western accent. Familiar. Glancing back, there's no one there. Without thinking, I speak. It's not the van. How do you know that? I don't know. I admit. There's a long silence, and Leo's tail curls inward. He's biting the inside of his cheek, thinking hard. Finally, he looks me in the eyes again. It's me. That thing? It follows me. I thought it was you, but it's... it's not you. You're different now. He gesticulates in my direction. Leo, I love... please, be quiet for a sec, huh? Leo interrupts the otherworldly voice like he's shushing a small child. Now he's looking at me, but his gaze seems to shift toward the horizon. A thousand yard stare. Chase, you all left and it was never the same. So I tried to cope. I remember all the stuff you used to say to me, even the naggy shit, all your banter. Hell I, I imagine every day at work that you're there with me, talking to me while I'm fixing cars. I pretend I'm teaching you about the basics, like changing oil or replacing headlights. I know it's not riveting stuff, but in my head, you love me and I love you. There's just some distance, that's all. And then I drive home, listening to whatever's on the radio and I imagine you reacting to it, groaning every time the word truck is mentioned in a country song or making some snide-ass remark about the political ads. A little smile curves up along his jowls, though it diminishes as quick as it forms. That little drop of blood running down the fur of his cheek finally splatters on the cab floor beneath him. When I get home, 
I go online and like, there's this pudding in my chest, like a dredge, you know? I click on the social media shit and it's you, like the real you, and you're different. You're wearing new shirts, hanging with new friends, drinking fancy college beers, growing terrible facial hair. I touch my ghosty briefly and Micah gives me a sidelong glance and it feels like I'm losing you all over again. So I just avoid it. I pretend. I pretend that we still drink together on the patio as the sun goes down on Saturdays. I pretend that you're there beside me at home, watching me play my games. And I pretend at night that pillow I've got in my arms wrapped around is you, making your little noises you, that you do when I ruffle your head fur or squeeze you. Leo plants his rump against the side of the cabin, sliding down to a sitting position as he clutches his head. And then one day, you started talking back. At first it was quiet. In the back of my head, not really noticeable. And over time it just got more real, yeah? Soon I was looking in mirrors and seeing you standing there. A reflection in a window or a pool of water. Sometimes I swear you could even touch me. But it wasn't you. Not the real you. It was the you I wanted you to be. This perfect, subservient thing. But it didn't make me happier. It was just a dream. A dream that kept blurring between, like, what was real and what wasn't. And so I wanted to see you, the real you, to, I don't know, get a grip, fix me. But it just made things worse when you didn't give a shit. When I would smile at you, you'd look away and you'd take every chance to hang at others instead of me. His eyes flick briefly toward Jenna before trailing back down to the space between his feet, the wolf breathing slowly. These past few days, it's been unlike anything I've ever felt before. I'd forget what was real and what wasn't, and it'd drive me up the wall, you know? So, sorry, they're just... He rubs his face. Fuck. The wolf goes still, the gravity of his words rendering everyone silent. Even the radio. Jenna, who seems to be constantly wavering between lingering and noping the fuck out of there, glances back over her shoulder. Her grievances with Leah and Micah are apparently lessened in the face of continued paranormal onslaught. So this thing that we're seeing, as manifested by the hum, is some sort of tulpa? A tulpa. The name sounds familiar, like something Cole mentioned to me in passing. In layman, a more advanced version of an imaginary friend. The Fennec frowns deeply, thinking. The process of induction, visualisation, thought form and other mental forcing can stimulate these sorts of psychosomatic happenings. Generally, you see it with people who say they talk to Jesus, or other religious icons that encourage prayer and meditation upon idols. You're saying, I'm like some kind of worshipped idol? Jenna sighs as Leo slinks down a little. I'm sure. That still doesn't explain why we can see or hear this thing. Honestly, it's more likely we're enduring some sort of collective traumatic hallucination. But right now, I'm just spitballing here to rationalise this. She swells her paw in the direction of the van. A person that others can see and interact with, both from a dream. We watch the radio, though it doesn't chime in. I think it's gone. Another silence. Finally, Micah speaks up. Jesus fuck, Leo. Can't he just print out Chase's yearbook picture and tape it to a flashlight like a normal person? Eo looks to Micah, his tired, wounded face slipping into a grin before he starts to chuckle. It's the first bit of proper laughter I've heard from him in days, even if it's bittersweet. Micah, I'm sorry. Dude, for real, it's fine. Micah watches Leo with some wariness in his golden eyes, crossing his tattooed arms over his chest. Nah. Hmm? What do you mean, nah? Nah. We may have just been messing around, but you had shit rough at home. Everyone knew. And I just didn't want to talk about it, yeah? You just disappeared one day and that was that. But you were small, didn't have no one to turn to. I should have been there for you. Micah scuffs his foot against the dirt, looking a mixture of frazzled and embarrassed at the conversation taking place. We didn't have that kind of relationship, not like you and Chase had. Relationship? The bat looks at me, quickly clarifying. It wasn't really a relationship or nothing. That was a bad word to use. Just two kids who both knew they liked dudes and experimenting. There's a twisting sensation in my chest as I look at both of them, then imagining them in the van. Right before what was essentially the most romantic night of my life, the day I felt most loved and special out of any. With a $700 camera and a three year age difference, Micah ignores Jenna. Judging by your expression, I'm guessing you never told you. 
I don't blame him. Leo scoots himself to the back of the van, hanging his legs off the end as he looks to me. And I should have. I just didn't want to lose you, you know? He's looking at me now. And yet he lost you anyway. Oh, it's all I can manage to say. Leo turns his attention back to my car. I'm no replacement for Keith, but I should have helped you get back on your feet, introduced you to the group. Dios, you and Chase would have gone the long after a while. Didn't you want to be a journalism major? Jenna, despite the apologetic tone of Leo, definitely doesn't seem eager to stick around for this conversation. Oh man, that was a lifetime ago. We could have taken your feral ass in, shown you how society works. Come on, you probably don't even know how to do your taxes. Micah clicks his tongue against the roof of his mouth, kinda like how Leo does. Fuck taxes, government ain't getting shit. Anyway, he clears his still raspy throat, wincing as he swallows. If you want to get ahead in life, you can't rely on others. Gotta get it for yourself. He passes a glance toward Jenna for a moment. We did. I chime in, still trying to wrap my head around that revelation from earlier. Micah looks like he's about to snap back with something biting, but just waves it off with a flop of his hand. Anyway, if you want to forgive this, you got it. Just just put some distance between us and this hum hot spot, okay? Please. Micah grunts once, beginning to walk off behind Jenna. After a moment, he slows some, looking back to Leo. Glad you uh, finally woke up, though. Let's get out of here, this is a horrible place. Jenna rubs her face into the pads of her paws. She's shaken, nerves frazzled. Micah and Leo, too. Though, I... I just feel numb. All this insane shit is happening around me and it's like a dream. Something not even real. There's a layer of separation between what I perceive and what's really occurring in front of me. Watching a playback of memories projecting right into my own eyes. It's not the first time I've felt like this, even outside of this supposed hysteria, but it's never been so strong. But as I glance behind me, the van's still there. Real as ever. Micah and the newly sobered Leo walk on ahead. Maybe it's like a minefield, you know? Projecting thoughts and shit for everyone to see? Yeah, just think real hard about Carl. We could take his spooky fucking doppel home with us instead, to save us some trouble. After a while, I can't make out what they're saying. They're talking with a more serious tone, their voices lowered. I'm not sure I even want to know what they're discussing now. As we approach the edge of the old highway, my eyes settle upon a small mound of dirt with a carefully placed stone on the centre. I'd walked down the stretch of Route 65 about a dozen times growing up, and I've seen this before, but was never curious enough to investigate. There's something about it that's drawing my attention, and then I realise why. The dream from last night? The grave. That's the spot. I stop, the others still walking ahead. They're following the road now back to town, or at least until we get to the railroad crossing, and then we can follow that. I look back to the mound of dirt and am compelled to approach it, without really thinking. I'm on my knees. Uh oh. Okay, we've got an option, and the only one option we have is to dig. Uh, what? Just do it. Next thing I know, I'm scooping the tips of my paws through the packed soil, digging up dirt and tossing the clumps aside. I don't know why I'm doing this. I close my eyes, trying to snap out of it. It doesn't help, and soon there's a musty smell in the air, like the inside of an old attic. I've managed to dig about a foot down into the earth so far, and the smell is only growing stronger. About two feet down, something solid touches my fingertips. I keep going, dusting off dirt around whatever it is. The surface is curved and cracked in places like pottery. Even before I get all the dirt off, I have a hunch of what this is. Two empty sockets stare up at me, and I stare back. Hello. A voice plays in my head, much more profound than I've ever heard it before. Uh, after all this time, to end up here. The voice almost sounds like it sighs, and then goes silent. Are you the guy in the grave? I ask the voice, which rings more clearly with each passing word. The way he sounds, is like he's right there, despite the unnatural cadence. The voice in my head. I whisper to the skull, compelled to touch it. Any skin of fur has long since rotted away, and the head itself is a yellowed ivory colour. His clothes from what are visible are in tatters, but the remnants of a button-up shirt and suspenders can still be seen. The voice doesn't respond, so I ask another question. Who are you? A tumbleweed rolls by along the road in front of me, the others getting further and further away. Instead of responding, 
I feel myself begin to dig further down, scooping out a few more mounds of dirt until something leather and small can be seen. A hardy little wallet with a snake emblem pressed into the centre. Flipping it open, several business cards and dollar bills practically dissolve in the exposed air, though there's a plastic ID card in the back. It's the driver's licence, clearly decades old, with the faded ink as several stamps covering most of it. What text can be seen is in that old-timey typewriter font. I wipe my thumb across the surface, wiping away the dirt and grime. Samuel Ayres, date of birth, 1890. There's a little picture of an elderly, pale feline with stark reddish-looking eyes that remind me slightly of Leo's. He looks haggard and sad, ancient really, a relic of another time. The man from my dreams. I should be terrified, but again, I still feel disconnected. A passive viewer who can only sometimes speak without any control. Now you know how I feel. I managed to swallow, peering into those sockets like they were looking back at me. I've never met a ghost before, I remark quietly. Not a ghost. Then what are you? Another drawn out silence, though this time I'll wait it out. Maybe, maybe something like that thing on the radio in the van. Just older and changed now. It's gone, but I'm still here. Clinging to you like a lifeboat in open water. We've been together for some time. Didn't see one another for a while, but you came back. They always come back. Together? I don't. I trail off, trying to wrap my head around what he means and what's really happening. I lean back some, feeling less resistance on my movements. I feel weird, like I'm not really here. You felt this way for a while now. It always happens like this over time. Here it's just a little stronger. With me. My gaze is pulled down to the license in my grip. Again, I read the name, Samuel Ayres. He goes quiet for a moment and speaks up again. With him. His voice falters, a strange conveyance of emotion in his otherwise stilted monotone presentation. I'll speak up again. There's something wrong with me. It's like I'm not doing things on my own anymore. You're not. I'm with you. You're indecisive by nature. What? How? I choose. That doesn't make any sense. Why are we connected? How do I make all this go away? He says nothing but I can hear him rumbling and stirring. At least 15 seconds pass before said stirring turns into words. You came back to find the truth, or oh, that's what you told yourself. Yet, you've known it all along. You just bury it over and over again. Each failing, uncomfortable moment or horror. You can't face anything. You're just like him. The man with the hat that's always too tight. Brain spattered on fresh grass, pine needles, and a whimpering child. I don't... You're weak. You're pathetic. There's a pause, and again his tone shifts, a deviation from his uniform speaking pattern. His voice sounds softer, distant, like an echo of something said far away. Be safe, kid. Before I have time to comprehend anything, I hear footsteps upon the asphalt in front of me. Chase, what are you still doing back here? What are you looking at? Jenna steps closer, peering into the little hole I dug. She thins her lips. Oh, what's going on? Leo's booming voice calls out from down the highway, the wolf looking back at us. Jenna stares and the desiccated remains for a moment before calling back. Chase dug up an old corpse? Uh, God damn it, Chase. Jenna sighs, resting her paws on her knees and letting her head hang down what he said. She looks up after a moment, spying the card in my hand. Is that ID? Yeah, Samuel Ayres is the name. I think he's the one who got hit by the van. Oh. She looks off to the side. Great. Huh? What, Chase? She responds, exasperated. Don't you care? Someone died here. I think he matters somehow. To me? Chase. Her eyes drift to the skull cropping out of the mound of dirt. God, I've passed this so many times just out here walking and never knowing that there's a person buried here. How old's the ID card? I squint at some of the smudged text. 70s, I think. 
At least that's when it was last renewed. Jenna frowns. The poor guy. She crouches down beside me, taking the license for a moment. You should hold on to this, so that we can give it to the proper authorities for them to handle. I wonder if anyone out there is still looking for him, or even remembers who he is. Her eyes flick over the little card, settling on the picture. He looks kind of familiar too. She hands me back the ID, and then extends out her arm to help me up. With a knot in my stomach, I take her hand and use her weight to rise back up without putting too much strain on my injured leg. I think he might be in my head. The words leave my mouth more casually than I meant, and Jenna does a little double take toward me before letting go. Well, tell him I said hi. We'll deal with him in a bit. She's just like Cynthia sometimes. He says you're like Cynthia sometimes? Jenna stares at me, then the grave, and then back to me. Um, she brings two fingers to her temple, massaging it. Chase, please don't listen to the voices in your head right now. She responds curtly as Micah arrives behind her, Leo hobbling at his side. Are you okay, Yoda? I looked at him for a long moment and answer honestly. I don't know. Same. Let's just get going, okay? Chase, you can keep leaning on me if it hurts to walk. I give her a grateful nod as I rest an arm on her shoulder. Thanks. As we head off, Micah lingers a little behind us, staring into the shallow grave. He steps off the road, pushing the dirt I've removed back into the hole with a few hasty swipes of his foot. Before anyone can ask us what he's doing, he catches back up with us, staring straight ahead. Wow, I think that that'll do for this episode. That was some pretty creepy stuff as well. Okay, we're going to carry on with our journey in the next episode. This is Usho signing off, and hopefully I will see you next time.